Welcome. I'm Michelle Cow, Executive Director of Business Development at Rogers Behavioral Health, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar, New Perspectives on the Opioid Epidemic and Medication Treatment. Joining me today are Dr. Laura Scaletta, Clinical Supervisor, and Dr. Nathan Valentine, Medical Director of Rogers Harrington Center for Mental Health and Addiction Recovery. Before we get started, I wanna give a quick overview of the format. Uh, the webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes. There will be no need to check in. To receive CE credits, you must be logged into the webinar for the entire program. A PDF of the PowerPoint slides and a list of references will be available after the program via an email sent from ce-go.com. In addition, a recording of the webinar will be published on the resources section of our website within the next few days for you to rewatch. Our speakers will give a 75 minute presentation. Following their presentation, I will facilitate the Q&A session. If you would like to ask our speakers a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A button, not the chat button, to send me a message. At the bottom of your screen, you simply click the Q&A button on the Zoom taskbar. I will review the questions submitted, then the presenters will address them during the Q&A portion of the webinar. Now I'll turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, Michelle. I'm Dr. Valentine and Dr. Scaletta will be joining us soon. Uh, for disclosures, neither of us have any significant disclosures. We have our learning objectives for the activity here, which I won't read through, but are available to you if needed. And an overview of what we'll be doing, uh, I will be presenting uh, some recent changes and also some historical context of opioid related mortality in the United States and what effect medication treatments, uh, especially treatment with buprenorphine or Suboxone have on mortality. And then describe some things we've done here recently at Rogers to try to increase, increase the use of medications. Uh, Dr. Scaletta will be uh, discussing psychological considerations for treatment engagement, uh, including contingency management and uh, identification of factors contributing to relapse. And then we will join forces for a couple of case studies. And if, if needed or desired, we could uh, discuss those at great length or relatively modest length. And then we'll be opening it up to the Q&A uh, as Michelle discussed. Uh, so thank all of you for joining this activity virtually. Uh, I wanna give an overview of the opioid epidemic because it's discussed a lot, talked about a lot, uh, brought up in the press, but it's really been a complicated series of events with uh, more than one phase and more than uh, uh, one trend in what's happening. Um, the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, did a pretty comprehensive uh, analysis of their data for the period between 1999 and 2019. So I'll be drawing on a lot of that data in this slide and a couple of the next ones to try to kind of give an overview and timeline of the opioid epidemic. And the period right around the turn of the century is generally identified as the beginning of the epidemic. Um, and one of many things that it has been attributed to is uh, an increase in the years before that in prescribing opioids for uh, pain, especially for chronic pain. Uh, so when prescribed for chronic pain, opioids would be prescribed at sometimes in large doses and large amounts indefinitely. Uh, which created a, a large supply of opioids uh, over a long period of time and, and did lead to some dependency. But I think we'll see that there's more to it than just that. Uh, but looking at this slide here, so in 1995 was the approval of OxyContin, uh, the version of, of opioid medication kind of, uh, it's the poster of villain for this whole thing. And there were some other uh, medications around the same time as well that were being uh, pushed pretty hard by uh, pharmaceutical companies as um, things that should be prescribed more. Right around the same time in 1996 was the first FDA approval to use buprenorphine for uh, MAT. So MAT here is medication assisted treatment. Um, so using a medication to help in, in addiction treatment. 
Buprenorphine is the active ingredient in Subutex and Suboxone. There's also other brand names um, associated with it. Um, certainly Suboxone is what people most commonly call this and that word's kind of used interchangeably. Uh, also buprenorphine is, is sort of tricky to pronounce reliably. So you might hear me inadvertently just use the brand name Suboxone and you can assume I mean any form of buprenorphine really. Um, so we have uh, these two main players in the early ep opioid epidemic, both hitting the market in the mid nineties. And around this 1999 to 2000 period, we see the first real rise in overdose deaths. So if we look at the green line at the top of this graph, that is total uh, opioid uh, deaths uh, in the United States that year. Uh, and this is a rate, this isn't total number of deaths, this is per 100,000 population. And we can see that in 1999, we're at about three, which was already a significant increase from a few years back here. And just about half of those deaths um, uh, were from heroin, I'm sorry, from prescription uh, opioids and uh, fewer from heroin. And uh, the synthetic opioids not uh, really a major player at that time. And this started to get a lot of attention both in the popular press and uh, the trade press and regulatory agencies around this period here, uh, the early 2000s to mid 2000s. And uh, a few things were done early on. Stronger warnings were uh, issued in the labeling for opioid medications. Uh, and then later in the uh, mid 2000s, uh, the FDA got a little more on top of things, sent a formal warning to Purdue Pharma, uh, the people who make OxyContin, about misrepresenting the medication in 2003. Um, and then quite a few actions between around that period and this 2013 to 2014 aimed at reducing the amount of prescription opioids on the streets. So these are things like uh, requiring a prescription uh, database monitoring program, requiring both prescribers and pharmacies to check that database before dispensing an opioid medication, uh, some changes in, in what they call scheduling medications, so tighter controls on these, um, and to the point where now it is uh, pretty tightly controlled. And these are uh, reasonable measures and have been largely effective in terms of reducing the amount of opioid prescriptions and the length of opioid prescriptions. However, as you can see from the graph that you've probably had pretty, plenty of time to look at now, it really hasn't been effective in reducing mortality from opioids. So we'll get into that in a little more uh, detail. Uh, other things of note on this timeline. So in 2002 is when the Suboxone form of buprenorphine was FDA approved. That is the same active ingredient, buprenorphine, with the addition of naloxone. And the naloxone is added as an abuse deterrent and also as something that in theory might make it more difficult to obtain a euphoric effect from the buprenorphine. Uh, the idea being that this might reduce the abuse potential of buprenorphine. Um, but for the purposes of our discussion, we can pretty much treat all buprenorphine products as uh, being essentially the same. Um, and right around 2010 here, let's look at that over here on the, the graph. I'm gonna try this telestrator function here. Let's see if I'm any good at it. I, I can fulfill my lifelong dream of being a sports commentator. So you can see right around here, we start to see a sharp rise in this orange line of uh, deaths related to heroin. And you see that's, that's several years before the really strong actions were taken to reduce the use of prescription uh, opioids. So we do see this small decline here in uh, prescription opioid uh, deaths. Uh, but at the same time that we're seeing that relatively small uh, desired effect, we're seeing a very rapid increase in, in deaths from the use of heroin. That's why I, I subtitled this slide, Playing From Behind. A lot of the things that have been done to try to address the opioid epidemic have been reasonable, um, but often uh, a few years behind what's actually happening on the street. And then uh, following that, we saw a uh, 
sharp rise here in the uh, uh, overdose deaths related to synthetic opioids. Uh, so synthetic opioids are uh, just like it sounds like synthesized from precursor chemicals uh, rather than derived from the opium poppy. And uh, these are primarily fentanyl and fentanyl derivatives that are responsible for these deaths. And again, that got a lot of press attention um, and some of which was certainly a little overblown as far as the lethality of, of fentanyl, um, but it is potentially quite dangerous, uh, especially if the person using it doesn't know exactly what they have, um, doesn't, and or the people producing it don't understand the difference in potency between fentanyl and heroin, for example. Um, although I think a, a lot of the the issue here is simply the more reliable supply. Because um, one of the other things happening here in the early 2000s, um, in addition to the uh, prescription opioids, is there were a lot of uh, geopolitical changes that suddenly made opium poppy production much easier and much more available, uh, primarily in Central Asia, so in Afghanistan and surrounding areas. And then later, uh, with some changes in drug enforcement policy in Mexico um, that were intended to reduce uh, uh, illicit um, agriculture uh, actually probably had the opposite effect. Um, so you saw a surge in both the availability and the demand of heroin. Um, and as those conditions changed again and, you know, producing uh, harvesting, making, and transporting opium poppies and their derivatives is hazardous business. Uh, as people began to uh, master the art of making synthetic opioids in, in an illicit fashion, uh, you know, that becomes likely a preferred way of producing uh, these things. Um, so uh, although fentanyl is certainly dangerous, this, this sharp rise that we're seeing in the curve here, I don't think we can blame entirely on fentanyl being dangerous, but uh, also just that we're seeing a continued growth in overall opioid deaths. Uh, and so we can kind of see these three basic waves here. If we look back to the green line, uh, the prescription opioid wave, and then the bump from increased heroin production and availability, and then a bump on top of that bump uh, from synthetic opioid availability. And uh, now that I've marked this thing into oblivion, you know, the, the other thing that's really concerning here uh, is you can see when, when one of these forms of opioids becomes a more common cause of death, the other ones don't really go down all that much. Uh, they have a relatively modest decrease, uh, even while the new one is increasing dramatically. And so these uh, different sources of mortality add up and we get this very concerning line here. So looking at the overall picture uh, between 1999 and 2019, it's obviously not a very encouraging picture. There was some thought here that things were starting to level out um, with more availability of treatment. Um, other things of note on, on the timeline is just that we've had a intranasal naloxone available since 2015, and there was a national emergency declared in 2017. Uh, naloxone is a short acting opioid blocker that's used to reverse overdoses. So it's a life-saving measure. Uh, and since 2015 has been available, uh, well, depending on the state, but now all over the place is available without a prescription at any pharmacy that chooses to provide it. Um, and that's an excellent thing. I think we've pretty well uh, covered that slide there. And there we go. This is a slightly different way. Oh, my annotations have stuck around, haven't they? I bet you I can fix that. There we go, oh, look at that. Okay, my apologies. Um, this is a number of drug-involved overdose deaths. Um, so these are mostly opioid-related deaths, but not entirely opioid-related re deaths. Uh, you'll get more clarity on that on the next slide. Um, so this is just raw numbers instead of rate statistics um, from the same study, the 1999 to 2019 uh, CDC study. And uh, 
not a whole lot to talk about here, just another way of seeing it. Um, going from under 20,000 deaths in 1999 to 70,000 in 2019. Those are pretty big numbers. Okay, so all that stops in 2019. Uh, and some of you might be aware that uh, something pretty important started to happen in 2020. Um, the COVID-19 epidemic has had a pretty devastating effect on mental health in general and also on individuals with substance use disorders. We've seen more people having trouble with substance use disorders, especially earlier in the epidemic. We saw a lot of difficulty with access to treatment, uh, both formal treatment, getting into a clinic that might be shut down or halfway shut down, um, having reduced transportation opportunities to get to a clinic, but also informal treatment, which is so important in the treatment of addictive disorders going to 12-step meetings or other peer support meetings, um, that sort of thing really took a huge hit, especially in the early days of COVID. Uh, so not only did we have a continuing influx of, of new individuals with substance use disorders, but as far as we know, we saw quite a few relapses of people who had previously been abstinent from their substance use disorder. So. We, uh, this is pretty recent uh, data here, hot off the presses. Uh, so the last 12 months of data, um, which nine months of which is post COVID approximately, um, you can see that this is not, uh, not what we want. Um, we went from what we thought was maybe leveling off this 70,000, 67,000, 70,000 deaths in the previous three years to now suddenly the largest increase that we've seen. Uh, so pretty discouraging stuff. And this, this gives a nice little breakdown of um, the, the substance involved. Um, you can see this kind of peach colored bar on the bottom is uh, labeled as synthetic opioid deaths. I think a, a more clear um, uh, title for that would be uh, any opioid death that includes synthetic opioids. It's certainly very common for someone with opioid use disorder to use something that might be a mixture of uh, heroin and fentanyl, and then maybe some oxycodone if they can get it, or, you know, so it's not all, it's not typically just one thing, uh, but you, you have the overdoses involving synthetic opioids, those involving any opioid. So that would be without synthetic opioids and then total uh, overdose deaths from all substances. Um, so opioids, we're looking at 69,000 deaths uh, last year uh, that we know of. Okay, this might be a bit dramatic and I apologize if so, but 70,000 deaths, 60,000 deaths, these can be tough to, to visualize. And I think a lot of people are familiar with the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, DC, and other ones that are similar to it across the nation. So this is a wall and uh, you can see this in the picture on the left, the names that are written on the wall in fairly small type. Each of those is somebody who died in, in Vietnam, um, an American. Uh, and it's a pretty big wall. You can see the aerial view here on the right. You can get a, an idea for the size of what that looks like. So that, that wall has approximately 55,000 names on it uh, that occurred over about 19 years. So what we're seeing right now with the opioid epidemic in the United States is a Vietnam or a Vietnam plus every single year. Um, it, truly a devastating epidemic. This is looking at rates of growth uh, in overdose deaths from different demographic groups. And don't have to spend a lot of time on it. I just wanted to include it because I think especially in the early days of the epidemic, a lot of the uh, popular or lay press coverage of the opioid epidemic kind of characterized this as a white suburban thing, uh, young white suburban people, especially. And, and while it certainly has affected that group of people, I think that led to um, a misperception that this is just a problem of, of rich white kids from the suburbs who are spoiled or something like that. And you can see that's really not true at all. And there's, there's some really nice raw data on the CDC website. Um, 
as well uh, that I did not include in the presentation. Uh, but th this is um, rates of uh, increase, uh, as you can see, uh, over uh, 2019 to 2020. So a couple things I want to point out. Um, young people are, are being very hard hit by this. A 48% increase in overdose deaths in one year. That's pretty devastating. And you can see the communities of color are very heavily affected here as well, uh, especially uh, uh, Black and Hispanic communities. Um, the other thing uh, I would point out here is uh, you don't see any groups that are zero or negative. So we have some groups that are being disproportionately affected, but, uh, and remember this is a percent increase. So we're seeing uh, it's bad everywhere and it's getting worse everywhere uh, for everybody. So that's a kind of a lot of bummers. Hopefully we can end on less of a bummer. What are some of the reasons that we, we haven't been able to get a hold of this, uh, even with uh, really pretty, at times, impressive amounts of resources uh, being uh, thrown at this problem and an increasing level of awareness of the severity of the problem. Um, well, one thing you'll, you'll see is from the earlier timeline slide is we, uh, we've had several things happen to make the uh, dangerous substances of abuse more available, but we haven't really had any new therapeutic weapons. A few. I mean, we've had the intranasal uh, naloxone. Some new forms of buprenorphine are recently available. Um, uh, but we've kind of been using uh, Vivitrol and, and buprenorphine as our main weapons on the medication side of things since this started. Uh, Vivitrol, if, if you don't know, is a medication that blocks the effect of opioids and also very effective. Um, anyway, but what we're seeing is Again, it's playing from behind. A lot of efforts have been made to increase the availability of treatment because we know that treatment can be pretty effective, but we keep getting new cases of opioid use disorder. And opioid use disorder has been able to grow faster than the availability of the treatment for it. So, you know, if I'm referring a, a patient for uh, outpatient opioid treatment uh, today, it's it, in many ways, it's a lot easier than it was 10 or 12 years ago. There's a lot more providers out there who are willing to take people and have had the training um, and a lot more variety of resources. The problem is there's a lot more people who need those resources. And we have continued to play from behind, not keep up. Um, and we discussed this a bit earlier, but you know the, the other tricky thing about it, the, an epidemic of a su substance use disorder is uh, people experience remission, but they don't necessarily experience a cure. So um, even if you can control or decrease the number of new cases, you still have all the old cases. And these are people who might be in remission, but people in remission are uh, at risk of having relapses. So uh, you get at least a partially summative effect of all the cases that have happened over the last you know, decade or two. Um, and when you see something happen like COVID-19, that's a particular problem. Uh, because you get a, a spike of relapses uh, combined with a reduction in availability of treatment. We have treatments that we know work uh, and we're just not utilizing them enough. The availability is an issue. And some, something we're gonna talk about uh, often on the next few slides and in our case studies is what are the expectations for someone to enter treatment? Um, and that's what I mean by excessive expectations to receive treatment. When uh, Suboxone was first FDA approved and, and for some time thereafter, I think the, the usual standard of practice was, you know, this is for a really ideal patient. This is for somebody who's motivated, engaged in treatment, um, has achieved abstinence from all the other substances, shows up for all their appointments, all of those things. Well, it certainly is a good treatment for people like that. And uh, people like that are quite successful with it often. Um, but the, the major shift in practice recently that we'll get into more detail about is kind of wondering, what, should we really be limiting these uh, medication treatments just to people like that? You know, what if somebody is partially engaged in treatment? 
what if they are sporadically using other substances uh, like alcohol or cannabis or cocaine, even if they've achieved abstinence from opioids? What if they make it to half their appointments? Things like that. Um, and, and there's a lot of variability in practice with that right now um, as, as far as um, starting or continuing treatment, especially with buprenorphine. And there are also many parts of the recovery community that take a dim view of medication assisted treatment. I do think this has improved, but um, certainly uh, depending on the, the area and the people there and the, and the meetings, you know, you'll, you'll hear a lot of negative things said about medications, including uh, Suboxone and peer support meetings. There are still quite a few sober houses, sober living facilities, other resources like that, that simply won't take somebody who is taking Suboxone. So the person has to choose between improving their living situation and continuing a potentially life-saving medical treatment. Uh, we have a lot of work to do on that still. Uh, so I keep talking about how buprenorphine works. I haven't backed that up yet. Um, so here's some, uh, some data on that. There's a whole bunch of papers out there if you're interested in this stuff. Uh, I just kind of picked one. Um, this is a large study from the Veterans Administration. And uh, you can see a significant reduction in mortality uh, for people who receive buprenorphine. Um, and also that uh, for people who did not receive buprenorphine in this study, they were at uh, their highest risk in their first two weeks after leaving treatment. Uh, some things I would highlight, I won't go over this entire uh, table, um, but I let me get my telestrator out here. Okay. Uh, if we just look at overall treated or not treated with buprenorphine, um, okay, we see no, sorry, we see number of deaths here out of person days at risk here, okay? And so you can see that we have a hazard ratio uh, adjusted at about 4.33. Uh, so in this particular study group, these exact numbers can vary a lot. Uh, depending on what group of people you're studying and what the other factors are. Um, but, you know, we see uh, over four, fourfold increase in mortality from people who um, did not receive buprenorphine. And these are all people who, who did, did get other forms of treatment too. Um, so it's just treatment with the medication or without the medication. Um, and then we can, we can also see here that, um, uh, as I discussed in the second bullet point, that effect, it's taking buprenorphine seems to help uh, suppress mortality rates even after an individual is no longer engaged in intensive treatment. Um, so it, it seems to sort of extend the, uh, the effect of being in treatment, at least in terms of reducing mortality. This is a uh, great big one. Um, looking at all cause mortality rate, you can, you can use this a lot. Uh, it's easier numbers to get. And it's, it's pretty effective for looking at opioid based mortality um, because uh, a lot of these people are uh, fairly young and uh, at relatively low baseline risk of annual mortality uh, and the overdose mortality risk is quite high. So you can, in most situations, use an all-cause mortality rate as a proxy for uh, deaths related to opioids, which are largely overdoses. There are some other poten potential ways to die from opioid use, but largely overdoses. Um, so we see methadone treatment. So probably most of you are familiar with that, been around a long time. Uh, the first four weeks of methadone treatment, methadone treatment after four weeks, buprenorphine first four weeks and buprenorphine after four weeks. So, uh, and I don't have these, these tables up here. Um, methadone does reduce mortality uh, for sure, but you can see that the first four weeks are, are pretty risky. Um, whereas we don't, these are large error bars, I, I'm aware, although there's, there's some other studies that are, are helpful in this too. 
we don't seem to have that difficulty with buprenorphine. Um, and uh, the other um, thing that you see, it's, it's not highlighted perfectly in this graphic, um, but you can see that when you're using buprenorphine compared to methadone, um, we see a reduction in mortality rate even once they're out of treatment compared to these numbers up here, okay? And this is something that, that we keep seeing uh, more and more uh, as an advantage of, of buprenorphine compared to, to methadone is that um, it seems like even when people are, are no longer engaged in treatment, their mortality risk is still reduced. Not as good as it would be if, if they are still in treatment, but still reduced. I think one of the most compelling examples of the effectiveness of, of buprenorphine is uh, what happened in France. Um, so early on uh, in the epidemic, um, it, which actually is, they had problems a little earlier than we did at larger scale, <coughs> excuse me. Um, uh, France took some very aggressive measures uh, to increase the availability of buprenorphine. Uh, so all physicians are allowed to prescribe it. You don't have to have special training or a special waiver. There's no limits on how many people you can prescribe it for. Um, there's also not a lot of insurance obstacles, a different health system, and uh, pharmacists are allowed to monitor treatment in certain um, situations. So, you know, if an individual can even get in to see a physician, you know, a couple of times here and there, they'll probably be able to have a consistent supply of buprenorphine prescribed. Um, and what they saw in the first two years after these changes is opioid deaths uh, reduced by 79%. That's this last number here. So a really drastic reduction in deaths um, just by making this medication extremely available. Um, so it concerns obviously in, in that situation, what about diversion, misuse, abuse, selling, stuff like that. And they estimate that that's certainly happening. In fact, they estimate that up to 20% of the buprenorphine prescribed in France is misused or diverted. They've made the policy decision that that's worth it um, and that they're okay with that. Um, I think in, in, in this country, we're probably unlikely to make a similar policy decision, uh, but I think it's, it's instructive um, just in a, in a very macro sort of context that more buprenorphine looks like means less deaths, even if you take it to a relative extreme as was done in this case. So what can we do? Like we talked about, you know, we're, we're not gonna do what France did. We have a different healthcare system. We have uh, different uh, legislative priorities, values and structures. It's extremely unlikely that we'll do what they did. Um, but we have had significant policy changes since uh, the first Suboxone approval. And, you know, in theory, buprenorphine would be more accessible than ever right now. Uh, the number of patients that a provider can see is higher. Uh, you know, this kind of goes back and forth a bit and changes a lot, but you know, some of the requirements are reduced um, as far as what a clinic or a provider needs to do. Um, access to buprenorphine in emergency departments has been increased um, and so on. So, but we're still not using it enough. Um, depending on what group of people you look at, you'll see a significant percentage of people who have opioid use disorder and are willing to take medication do not have access to it. Um, so as providers, you know, we, 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 can, we can advocate for changes in policy. We can't do changes in policy. We can do changes in practice. Um, and I do think there's actually a lot of room for uh, improvement um, just in changes of practice, you know, without having to change laws or policies or things like that. Um, and uh, I do also want to highlight this last point. Um, we have ample studies now that indicate, again, even, even for individuals who are not as engaged in treatment as we might wish, um, or who might be described as low motivation, uh, they die less frequently when they're prescribed buprenorphine. And you know, one way I like to look at this is uh, a low motivation individual who stays alive is going to become a high motivation individual at some point. Uh, a low motivation individual who dies uh, never does, obviously. Um, 
So we've been working on this here at, at Rogers. I just want to uh, highlight this as an example uh, of uh, what some possibilities might be. Um, we have the things we call rapid improvement events where over a sh relatively short period of time, we try to make a big difference in practice. So uh, looking at one of our inpatient units that gets a lot of individuals who detox from opioids. So that might be the primary reason for their admission or it might be an additional concern. Maybe they're admitted for suicidal ideation or for something else, but also require opioid detox. Uh, before this project, a significant percentage of those individuals, uh, 80 some percent, were um, receiving an FDA approved recovery med, usually buprenorphine because uh, it's acute uh, and they're uh, detoxing, but could be naltrexone as well during their hospital stay. Uh, but only 1.4% of those individuals were getting a prescription to leave with. Sometimes that's fine. Sometimes they already have a doctor. They're going to a treatment program the next day. They're going to a residential program. Um, so maybe not quite as bad as it sounds, but 1.4% is pretty low. Um, so we had some relatively mild interventions. Uh, we created a reminder uh, to pop up at the time of discharge that a provider would see based on whether the person had an opioid related diagnosis. Um, we created a standard work, kind of a, a policy light um, that encouraged providing prescriptions and provided some guidelines. Because meeting with the providers who worked on this unit, what I found is most of them were perfectly willing to provide a prescription. They just wanted some guidelines and they wanted reassurance that that was an okay thing to do. You know, that it wasn't gonna be a uh, DEA black helicopter who's coming through the ceiling sort of situation if they started doing that. And we, we also had a significant number of patient refusals contributing to that. And so we created some educational materials uh, uh, for patients so they could um, know what they're getting into. And uh, so we saw these numbers increase dramatically uh, after those 35, 26, 50, 25, you know, so um, right up uh, significantly higher. And we were also able to track the reasons uh, it wasn't given in most of these situations. And most of those were those situations that we talked about in which um, somebody is going immediately to a treatment program or has easy access to uh, prescriptions when they leave and so doesn't need a prescription. Uh, the other thing we saw is that individuals were more likely to start their next level of care. Um, say they're going to a PHP or an IOP or something like that, they were more likely to get there if they had a prescription to tide them over. Um, and the, there was a concern uh, prior to this project that um, uh, we might see an increase in uh, readmissions or repeat admissions. Um, you know, the, the thinking being maybe uh, people would just use the hospital as a way to get prescriptions. And we did not see that. We saw no change in readmissions and maybe even a slight improvement. Uh, for that, I, I would just say, you know, with, with this population, you know, it's depend, depending on exactly what your area is, this is a, a population where you do see remission, you see readmissions, you see, I mean, it, it just kind of goes with the territory and it, it can be tempting to attribute it to, to something um, and say this is happening because we're giving people prescriptions right? when maybe the, it was going to happen anyway. Um, and so we did not see any of those undesired uh, side effects of this change. Okay. So uh, I think we've, we've kind of been over most of these points uh, quite a bit. Um, the specific example that I, I gave from Rogers was based on inpatient level of care, but there, there's just so many small and large opportunities, I think, in all systems to try to use these medications more. And we know that that's gonna keep people alive if we do it. Um, and focusing on the modifiable uh, uh, obstacles, including attitudes among us, uh, patients or individuals suffering from substance use disorders themselves, families, 12-step meetings. You know, I, I never pass up an opportunity to try to correct some, some misconceptions about these, these medications. And I think the other thing we can learn from, from our experience here is that you know, a small intervention at a system level can have a big impact on, on utilizing these, these medications. Okay. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Scaletta to talk about uh, some of the therapy side of these things. Hi everyone. Uh, 
Um, today, I would like to talk about some complementary methods we can have that work well with um, the medication management side of things that Dr. Valentine highlighted through his portion of the presentation. Um, and also, I would like to talk through some of the risk factors that we can look for in individuals who are struggling to attend treatment or struggling to remain abstinent from their substance in this presentation, looking particularly at opioid use. Next slide, please. Um, so first I would like to start with the risk side of things so that we can set a foundation for some of the interventions and strategies that I'll be talking through. Um, particularly those interventions and strategies looking at contingency management, um, and I will explain that in detail as we go along, and also increasing family and support system involvement. Um, by no means is this risk for relapse or treatment non-adherence list uh, comprehensive. There are always things that we can think of and pick apart and pieces to all of these, but I wanted to really represent where some of the research is showing us that we're having risk and also what is within our control, what are things that we recognize are influential and broke it down a little bit into modifiable and non-modifiable risks. Um, that being said, some of these can be argued to be on the alternative list. Um, but to use one of the examples on here, such as chronic pain, recognizing that, yes, there are many interventions for chronic pain in terms of medication management, physical therapy, nutrition, exercise, et cetera, we know that chronic pain, it could continue despite those interventions and not all factors are controlled specifically by behavior changes or by the, the person that's experiencing it. So just to give a little bit of background of where this list is. Um, so on the modifiable side, I've highlighted three with the arrows that I would like to address through this presentation. So that being tr treatment resistance or struggling to attend treatment, not necessarily resisting it. Um, and then also low motivation for treatment um, and also the another modifiable factor being lack of family or support system involvement. Um, not necessarily family can be a wide definition. It doesn't necessarily mean that someone needs their, um, their family of origin involved. It could be an identified family, could be loved ones, could be sponsors and community programs, et cetera. Um, Another modifiable risk is negative emotions. So struggling with more of the um, affective side of things and struggling with negative symptoms of mental health, looking at coping ability, ability to deal with cravings, triggers, um, personal well-being, being able to struggle or work through um, ups and downs in terms of recovery and being able to deal with life stressors. Um, also looking at conduct disorder symptoms as something that is has been highlighted as modifiable. So part of looking at these risks, I was looking at a study conducted in 2021. It looked at the most influential factors for relapse between cisgender males and cisgender females in particular, and what because there are some differences for those two populations of what increases risk. So for, um, for cisgender females, risk factors tend to be um, more co-occurring substance use concerns and then the severity of use and also having greater withdrawal symptoms, which you'll see on the non-modifiable list. These are some things that have really impacted that population. And then on the cisgender male side of things, having a younger age, so another one of those mod non-modifiable um, risks, and it ties well into what Dr. Valentine was talking about, where we're seeing really high mortality in a younger age group. 
And then also um, having poly substance use and histories of conduct disorder behaviors. So looking at um, stealing, law breaking, um, violent crimes, things of that nature are um, things that impact relapse risk for people who use opioids. Um, also looking at poor sleep as something that can be modified um, that also greatly increases risk for relapse and is a vulnerability in terms of that. On the non-modifiable side, looking at um, not just genetics, which obviously family history impacts um, substance use, severity of use and relapse risk, but also looking at childhood experiences and um, trauma experiences. If you are well-versed in the ACEs study, looking at how adverse childhood experiences impact certain physical health ailments, impacts more likelihood of mental health diagnoses, looking at subs increased substance use risk. So some of the examples on that study look at um, neglect, parent incarceration, physical abuse, um, sexual abuse, and things, and having a family member who is using in your environment as well. Um, also looking at age, younger age being more likely to increase risk. Looking at sexual orientation. So the research indicates that individuals who identify as bisexual or as attracted to someone that societally they're told they shouldn't be attracted to, struggle more with substance use. I would like to put a caveat on some of these things like sexual orientation, gender identity, race, and ethnicity. While these for the person are not modifiable, we can argue that there are other factors that influence why this, this risk is higher for these populations and individuals. Um, looking at models of like the minority stress model, knowing that longer exposure to prejudice and discrimination, increase health risks, increase substance use, and increase mental health symptoms. So we recognize that there are other factors here, but looking at the individual level, um, we, there is much more research needed in um, understanding how substance use impacts the transgender community. Um, but we do know that based off raw data, there are more individuals who are impacted um, with substance use disorders um, in the transgender community. There's a lot higher rate of misuse of substances and whether that's um, illicit substances or prescribed opiates. Um, we also recognize that people of color struggle with increased uh, risks of substance use as well. And again, to tie that back into there are environmental factors that influence those things. Um, we also recognize that those with um, a lower socioeconomic background can struggle with substance use. Um, that also ties back into the ACEs that I talked about where people um, have more of those stressful long-term life experiences. Um, and then also looking at chronic pain and individuals who are prescribed opioids for their chronic pain are more likely to end up abusing uh, opioids. Um, we also recognize that having a co-occurring mental health diagnosis increases misuse of opioids. Having prior substance use treatment, so recognizing that the severity of um, the use that an individual has and struggling with relapse despite prior treatment, we understand that that makes it more difficult for someone to continue and sustain that, that recovery. Um, and I already touched on having greater withdrawal symptoms and then also looking at overdose history. Those who have a history of overdosing on a substance are actually more likely to be open to treatment at higher levels of care, like intensive outpatient, partial hospitalization, residential. So it can be a protective factor. Obviously the origin of having an overdose is not ideal. And we recognize that those individuals might be more open to treatment options. 
Next slide. So today I would like to highlight contingency management. For that, um, the basic definition of that is it is a behavioral intervention. Patients receive material incentives that is directly contingent on something that we can objectively verify. So a very common example of this looks like someone comes in to receive treatment, completes a urinary drug screen, the test can, a rapid test can show that it's negative for substances and a material incentive is immediately um, given. And we will talk through a few different ways that this looks and what, what works well for this and some considerations. Um, this strategy and behavioral intervention is based on operant conditioning principles. So for those of you who have had a minute to before or since the last time you've talked about um, operant conditioning, we look at the reinforcement side where we see positive reinforcement. So a stimulus is presented or something is added to try and get a desired behavior to increase. So that may look like um, I do the dishes, I get an allowance. I've added something and then hopefully my behavior of doing the dishes will increase. Negative reinforcement looks at a stimulus is removed in hopes of still having a behavior increase. So a common example of this is I have a headache, I take a medication, my headache disappears. Now that I have that relief, I am more likely to take medication when my headache is present. On the punishment side of things where people often try and function, especially with interventions of taking things away or um, not allowing individuals back into treatment after struggling to maintain treatment, we see positive punishment. So if we add an undesired stimulus, we want to decrease a behavior. So if I'm a child in an example, if I use a curse word, someone adds a chore that I have to do in hopes that I don't curse anymore. And then negative uh, punishment, looking at um, an example of if I use a curse word, you take away video game time for me. So being able to recognize that there's different ways that we can reinforce behavior, and this will help set the foundation for contingency management. Next slide. In understanding those operant conditioning principles, we recognize that substance use and substance abuse is reinforcing in itself. So when someone uses a substance, they receive feelings of euphoria, they receive a high, um, and we recognize that dopamine is released. So the reward pathway is stimulated. On the other side of things, we recognize that it can reduce negative feelings, whether it's emotional situations, stressors, or withdrawal pains. Opioids being a pain reliever can also impact this because it's prescribed for other things and then can lead to um, a situation where someone can also receive that euphoria and then can lead into misuse. Um, in addition to that, substance use in general results in the loss of other positive reinforcers like a job, um, having fulfillment with that, having close family, having friends. Um, so what the result is, is that substance use continues to reinforce itself and then it hijacks that reward pathway in our brain. So with contingency management, what we're trying to do is replace some of that positive reinforcement that has been lost through substance use and trying to make it directly tied to the decrease in substance use. Next slide, please. Um, some of the data shows that on its own contingency management has, as you can see on this graph here, has some about a moderate effect size. And CBT, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, also has kind of a, a low to moderate effect size. 
When put together with CBT and contingency management, these two things help help to complement each other and increase the treatment outcomes that we're seeing. So not just people being present in treatment, but also shows a better outcome at the end of treatment, more progress in terms of substance use and also mental health symptoms. That being said, um, I recognize that the information, the meta-analysis that was used for this and the information this is based on, there were only two studies representing the combination of the two. So it's an area of further research that we need to really understand how these two things can coincide together. Um, and there is fear out there that uh, contingency management only addresses extr extrinsic intrinsic motivation. Um, which some believe doesn't translate to intrinsic motivation, but it's showing promise in some studies that we still can increase that internal motivation to change use of substances rather um, than it only remaining an external reinforcer. Next slide. One of the large studies that was done, and this information was released um, just a couple of months ago in 2021, uh, looking at studies for the last few years up until 2020, doing a meta-analysis meta of um, at least 60 different studies looking at contingency management protocols, all of which had um, monetary incentives, um, there are different ways to do contingency management, but the bulk of the research is in the efficacy of having a monetary intervention or some sort of um, material or voucher system. Um, and looking at these studies and seeing when compared to control groups, how impactful was this intervention of having contingency management? Um, to give some reference for what the monetary um, influence was. So for this uh, portion is looking at therapy attendance. And then when I get to the, to the next slide, we'll look at uh, opioid abstinence. So we see in here, the total effect size was a, a low to moderate um, range with almost all studies favoring the intervention, except for that one um, that shows a little bit less um, impact. And I, I looked at some of the differences between the higher and lower effect size studies. Um, for this one in particular, there was um, some differences in recruitment in terms of for where we saw the lowest effect size, it was individuals who were referred from and recruited from a syringe exchange program. So there is room to say that maybe they were not ready for treatment um, in other ways, and then were added to treatment studies. Um, all of the individuals in all of these studies were also using um, an MAT intervention for their opioid use um, disorders. So this shows contingency management in complement of medication-assisted treatment. Um, and then for some of the ones with therapy attendants, we saw that they had higher rewards, so higher monetary value. And then there were also some counseling services offered. So that study there in 2013 that has the highest um, effect size, it has some other um, factors included. Next slide, please. Um, for this one, this highlights opioid abstinence. So also in this same meta-analysis, looking at individuals where the behavior that was being targeted is negative drug screens related to opioids. Um, we see an even more favorable uh, outcome for the interventions where all of the studies that were looked at favored the intervention rather than the control groups. And we're looking at a moderate um, effect size for that. Um, 
there were other substances looked at in this study and just to give a little bit of an, a comparison. So there were studies done where individuals had polysubstance use that had a little bit of a lower effect size when applying contingency management um, due to the complexity of what, what behavior we're targeting. And then on the other side, um, contingency management for a primary stimulant uh, use disorder or for cigarette smoking were much more on the higher range, um, about a, like a 0.7 to a 0.78 effect size. So seeing it work different, contingency management work differently for different um, presenting issues and different concerns. Next slide. So actually implementing contingency management. First, the goal is to choose which behavior we would like to impact. So like we saw with some of the studies that have been done, some of it might be attending treatment. Some of it might be abstinence from a substance of choice. Some of it could be abstinence from all substances. Um, and then we want to objectively measure it. Like I mentioned in the beginning, a lot of studies are frequently based off of urinary drug screens, having a negative test. If you're looking at treatment attendance, some looked at on-time um, attendance and not having unexcused absences. Um, depending on the substance that we're looking at, if it's more like nicotine or alcohol use, there might be need to be more like daily screenings to, to see what's going on. For opioid use, the recommended um, for contingency management, the recommended number of UDSs is no less than two, but the sweet spot is three per week to make sure that we're reinforcing consistently. Um, we see versions of contingency management already out there in the field. Um, this might look like 12 step groups offering donuts and coffee, uh, clinicians offering praise for someone showing up. Some of the contingency management strategies that we're seeing really high results with are ones that are actually using these monetary and um, other types of reinforcers. So a few that are common uh, might be voucher systems or giving cash. Um, some There is some concern in the field and some people have hesitance when they're using contingency management um, systems for worry that cash will be triggering for individuals. So some have opted on a voucher system. This looks very similar to a token economy. So individuals might receive um, a, come to a clinic, have a negative urinary drug screen, and then receive a coupon for a voucher. Every time that they provide a negative sample, the voucher increases. Um, in some instances and on some systems, it doesn't. What we're seeing is when increases occur in, in the prize, it, it impacts the longevity of abstinence from substances rather than reinforcing intermittent abstinence. Um, and then in some cases, Clinics do different things where they might have a prize closet where individuals can use their vouchers to purchase things like um, gently used donated items, uh, electronics, games, uh, radios, things of that nature. Some use vouchers to go out and purchase a desired um, item for an individual. So once they've received enough vouchers, they might be able to access food or clothing items, sporting equipment, haircuts, gift certificates, things of that nature. Um, and then looking at some, uh, some sites are using clinic privileges. So contingency management is most represented in methadone clinics. And sometimes a change in dose might happen or uh, the ability to have an early dosing hour so they don't have to wait in line or having a preferred parking spot or being able to take your dose home. These are some ways that clinic privileges have been used. Um, and then also looking at refunds and rebates. So some people pay upfront for services in the treatment facility, 
And when they've completed a 12 week treatment course, being able then to receive a refund or rebate for the services received. Um, some important features of a contingency management system include frequency. So recognizing that you want to reinforce a behavior that occurs frequently. If someone reports they only use a substance a couple of times a year, that is not something that would be ideal to use for a contingency management um, system. So what we want to do is we want to be able to measure regularly and continue to reinforce it. Um, we also want immediacy. We want to be able to give that voucher or cash or coupon immediately after that negative read has happened. If there is time in between the behavior and that, that reward or that voucher, we're less likely going to build that connection between those two behaviors. Um, we also want to look at magnitude. Um, the prize provided needs to be valuable. It needs to be worth it to the individual. Um, we can also decrease the magnitude once a new behavior is established. If we've seen a behavior for over three months, we might be able to reduce that and focus on a different behavior. Um, some behaviors might allow for lower magnitude prizes, such as treatment attendance or appropriate behaviors in group therapy, for example, that might have a little lower magnitude, while abstinence from substances will likely require a higher magnitude prize with um, more value added to it. Um, we want to make sure that there is a variety of selection for individuals seeking, um, seeking these services so that if someone doesn't like what is being offered, we have options and then also consistency. So um, we want to make sure that we are being consistent when we're reinforcing information um, and these behaviors. Next slide. A couple of notes on the schedules of reinforcement. I talked about it with the voucher system, but some of the most supported contingency management services look at escalating reinforcers and giving bonuses. So for example, if I have a urinary drug screen three times a week, um, if I am able to provide a negative sample three, that those three times, not only am I receiving my voucher, I might receive a bonus of five extra tickets by the end of that. Um, I might be able to, um, have also that escalating prize. So first week, maybe I receive $2 worth of a voucher. By week two, maybe it's $3.75. By week three, it could be $5, depending on how the system is set up. Um, there are also schedules of reinforcement that look like intermittent schedules of reinforcement. So for example, instead of vouchers, we could have a fishbowl where individuals, every time a negative sample is provided, we can draw slips. And when um, a certain amount of slips are drawn, then we can have them have kind of a raffle for prizes. Um, there is, has been some pushback in this one in some individuals struggle with the idea that it could be similar to gambling. But in that case, we recognize that they're not giving anything personal um, to, to contribute to that. This is a prize that's earned and is based on a specific behavior. Um, and also, we can look for any concerns or signs of gambling abuse um, when we are screening individuals for contingency management programs. Um, next slide. There are some barriers currently to using contingency management and the implementation of it. For one, looking at federal and local laws. So CMS impulse, imposes annual limits on incentives that are provided. So there's a maximum monetary value of $75. Some also independent um, insurance providers, similarly about $100 per year. 
In a lot of these research studies where individuals are being provided with contingency management, um, the monetary value can look like $600 per three months, $1,000 per individual for three months. There are studies now that are looking at lower cost contingency management, um, looking at how uh, clinics and places can still use these interventions while being able to recognize that money is finite and the available resources might not be present. So being able to have something like a fishbowl where the reinforcer happens every time with drawing a ticket or a raffle ticket, but every time you draw out of the fishbowl, you might not win a prize or using lower monetary value might be an option for places too. Um, there is stigma as with most um, considerations and some, some of the areas of stigma that have come up is there's a belief that abstinence should be a given, not rewarded, but we recognize with what we know that mitigate, mitigating risk through what we have is important. And then also belief that contingency management is swapping substance use for gambling. Um, and what we would want to do is make sure that we are doing inclusion and exclusion screening for any individuals who identify having uh, issues with gambling and also make sure that we are using systems that, again, contingent on the behavior, not on risking to gain reward. Um, and then cost, as I talked about, for a lot of um, providers and a lot of clinics can be a barrier in terms of what is available. Next slide. And last, I wanted to touch on another um, aspect of treatment intervention that can help mitigate some of the risks of um, individuals who are struggling with opioid use. So we recognize that family or support system engagement and treatment uh, independently can predict increases in treatment retention in individuals who have an opioid use disorder. So recently with that, we have piloted a program within the Rogers system. So some of my information will come from that experience. So looking at being able to provide a combined approach of psychoeducation and then some process discussion focused on family members and friends separately from the work that is being done with patients. Um, it's based in the CRAFT model. And if you aren't familiar, that's the community reinforcement and family training model, looking at how support systems can be present and can offer validation without going to links such as having an intervention or trying to force someone into treatment. So increasing motivation through support rather than and education for the family system, rather than forcing an individual because we know that long-term that won't support treatment engagement. Next slide. And some of our um, early data in the pilot portion of the program in the first six months, we saw less of an impact on residential treatments. Um, and there could be a lot of factors involved in that, including having 24 seven um, staff support, having clinical support, that we likely were already seeing some of that support system happening. But looking at partial hospitalization, we saw an increase in length of stay. And that difference of almost four days could be an entire week of treatment if someone's in programming Monday through Friday. So some promising results of what it looks like to have family and friends more directly involved in treatment and being able to offer those educational tools and start to, to really address some of those risks for relapse and for um, risks for someone deciding to leave treatment. Next slide. So as a summary, looking at um, some, there are many risk factors to consider when, an when treating an individual and some of the um, methods of mitigating those risks can look like contingency management. And we know it's an effective tool to um, increase not only abstinence from 
a substance, but also treatment attendance, and then also being able to build up those family and community support systems. So for this next portion, we would like to talk through a case study. I'll take this over for now and I'm, I'm gonna run through it because I don't wanna get into our Q&A time too much because I'm really eager for the questions and answers. Um, this is an 18 year old gentleman who was admitted to our residential program here. And this is anonymized, but so this is a story that we see a lot and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, he had opioid use disorder, also a lot of comorbidity, pretty bad PTSD mood disorder. Uh, was induced on buprenorphine, did well with that, had a good response to it. However, poor engagement in treatment, not going to groups, family is chaotic and not very involved. Um, and he also had some pretty unsafe behavior while here uh, that didn't respond to interventions and eventually required him to be discharged uh, sooner than we would have liked. This is a type of person who 10 years ago, I probably never would have given a prescription to take home with him for buprenorphine. Uh, but based on some of the things that, that we've talked about, you know, realizing uh, the actual requirements for buprenorphine treatment, has opioid use disorder, tolerates and has a good response to the medication, has follow-up care available to him and willing to do that care, even though it's not, you know, exactly what we would have wished with having to get them on a wait list and being in a rural area and stuff like that. And even though many parts of his behavior were not what we wanted, uh, you know, no evidence of diversion or, or selling Suboxone or anything like that. So um, I was actually thinking about th this case. I didn't even have to think very hard about willingness to give a prescription to this person when they left, whereas you know, years ago, uh, it either would have been a flat no or I might have agonized over it. So um, I think that's pretty well supported by uh, some of the evidence that we uh, went through uh, earlier. Do you have anything to add to that, Dr. Scaletta? Um, no, I think you really well hit it. I think um, in terms of treatment engagement, we could address, you know, some of the family involvement by offering differing levels of family involvement in terms of, you know, if they don't want to be involved in a family session, having education where they don't need to have interaction with the patient or being able to mitigate some of these risks in other ways. Um, but I think you really hit a lot of those areas where we've changed how we would approach this case. Thank you so much, Dr. Scaletta. Can we, can we skip on to Q&A now? I think so. OK, let's go ahead and do that. Yeah. Michelle. Thank you, Dr. Scaletta and Dr. Valentine, so much. Um, now it's time to answer questions. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button, not the chat feature, on the Zoom taskbar. We'll try to answer as many as we can in the time we have remaining. If we don't get to your question, please send me an email message afterwards and I'll follow up with you. Okay, let's see. It looks like um, the first question is, um, you discuss the efficacy and evidence behind Suboxone. Does research demonstrate the same results for other FDA approved medications such as methadone? And so there's, there's three uh, medications that are FDA approved specifically for opioid use disorder. So buprenorphine or suboxone, uh, naltrexone, uh, which blocks the effect of opioids and is available in a long acting injection called Vivitrol um, that's heavily used and then methadone. Um, <clears throat> so all three of these are effective. Um, they all reduce mortality and reduce rates of relapse. Um, there are some differences. Uh, there was the one slide that indicated a higher risk of mortality early in methadone treatment. Uh, without getting into too much detail, the, the, the likely reason for that is methadone is a kind of a standard issue opioid. It activates opioid receptors just like any opioid would. So when somebody is early in treatment and receiving methadone, if they were to relapse, they're going to have the additive effect of the methadone plus whatever they relapse on potentially increasing the overdose risk. 
Meanwhile, buprenorphine is what's called a partial agonist at opioid receptors. So it activates it up to a certain point and then it levels it off and actually provides some blocking effect beyond that point. Um, so early in treatment, if someone gets off to a rocky start with maybe some intermittent use or some relapses, then uh, their mortality risk is gonna be lower with buprenorphine compared to methadone. Uh, Vivitrol is quite effective. Um, the the uh, difficulty there, uh, and if you look at overall mortality rates, it's similar to buprenorphine. The difficulty there is getting somebody started on it um, because they need a period of abstinence uh, without medication before they can start it. Uh, it can be very uncomfortable and very difficult if they're experiencing withdrawal or if they're in a negative environment with easy access to substances. Um, so getting it started is, is kind of the biggest problem with Vivitrol. Um, uh, it, it can certainly be uh, quite effective. Um, and the other potentially unique benefit of buprenorphine, which we need more research to determine is, is as I alluded to on a couple of the slides, it looks like it might have some additional protective effects even after people start treatment. Uh, that might be unique to buprenorphine. That requires more study. Thank you. Someone asked um, the end result of Donovan, did he, did he relapse? Did we, uh, we try to keep touch with people. Uh, and I, if I recall correctly, he, he did answer our follow-up call and uh, stated he was doing well and was still awaiting uh, to start the program in, in his home area. Um, so okay. I don't have any better information than that though. Good to hear. Um, you mentioned attitudes and stigma towards the use of Suboxone. What are some things that a non-prescriber could do to support a patient um, taking medications? Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I think uh, depending, and then there become difficulties with scope of practice and stuff like that as far as, you know, how much specific things can you say about a medication if you're not a medication provider. Um, but I, I think it's reasonable to um, have the educational materials like those available from SAMHSA that you can share uh, with, with clients. Um, uh, to, if you're familiar with the recovery network in your area to try to maybe point people towards uh, groups or meetings or other facilities that you know have a positive attitude towards medication use. Um, and, and then what I do when I have a patient or a family who's reluctant uh, to consider medications is I just start with a whole bunch of whys. You know, what is, because it could be a different reason for different people. Um, common things are, oh, I know this one guy who was on it for eight years and he couldn't get off it, or I don't want to be addicted to a substance anymore. Um, I hear it's worse to get off than heroin. Um, that stuff is for junkies. You know, so it's the, it, but it might be something totally different. Uh, I can't afford it. Uh, I'm worried about affording you know. And so if I know the, if I know the reason uh, that they're reluctant, it helps me try to address that. Um, uh, so those would be my, my main thing. So do you have anything else, Dr. Scaletta? Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, um, how would you recommend uh, starting a contingency management program in an outpatient program? There's a lot of background and structural um, changes that would need to occur. So someone would need to own the contingency management program. So does that look like um, having one specific clinician there ready to give the contingency management rewards? Or does that look like the primary therapist on a caseload helps with um, providing those rewards right away? Um, there, you would want to follow the guidelines put out of how often are behaviors um, being pulled for? What objective measures are we using? Is it a urinary drug screen? How often does that happen? And then having guidelines of what receives a reward and what doesn't. So clinics would want to look at what happens if there's an excused absence. Do we um, allow someone to bring in a doctor's note because they were at a different appointment? Are there unexcused absences? In that case, it would be recommended to drop back to point one of providing a reward if there's an escalating reward. So a lot of structure needs to be put into place. 
And then I briefly mentioned inclusion and exclusion criteria. So the, the outpatient clinic would need to know who would meet this criteria. Is it someone who specifically is being treated for opioid use disorders? So then anyone else being treated at that outpatient um, provider might not um, be referred to a contingency management program. Or are we targeting everybody in terms of are they uh, um, attending programming? So a lot of behind the scenes structural things to get started in an outpatient clinic um, to really set a good foundation for it. If anybody's looking for a cool startup idea, I think it'd be really needed to make a uh, contingency management program in a box that you could sell to uh, <laughs> clinics anywhere with all the stuff you need to get started, all the regulatory stuff in there. So I'm not going to do it. So go. it's a, a free idea if anybody wants to run with it. There are definitely manuals out there, but I like the box idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Our final question is, what are some interventions you have used to engage family members that are resistant to participating in treatment? Um, from, the, from the psychological behavioral side, there's, you know, I, I think Dr. Valentine made a good point. We start anywhere with the why, right? Um, you know, is, are there contentious relationships? Are families scared? Are they, do they feel like if they support someone in treatments that they're um, reinforcing things or are they, do they not know what to do? So we, you know, in my experience, we've offered different levels of family involvement. The goal is to have full involvement, but, you know, for some people, it might be more comfortable communicating through email or just trying set small goals of being able to call your, your loved one once a week. Um, you know, there can be like our, um, pilot program of having family involvement that doesn't involve the patient being present. That is just psychoeducation for the family. Um, are they more comfortable with that because they're not ready? Um, and trying to use motivational interviewing techniques. So what is the long-term goal educating family on how the whole system is impacted when substance use is happening, rather than them feeling like it's just on the patient to change behaviors. And I get a, I get kind of a, a cheat code there. Um, since I am their doctor, I can, as long as the patient is willing to provide a release, I can just call the family and say, oh, I'm just checking in, you know, I'm the doctor with your person here. And then try to kind of subtly get them involved a little. And, and if they have questions, say, hey, you know, that'd be a great thing for you guys to discuss if you came in and had a family meeting with a therapist. And you know, sometimes that can, that sneaky approach can work a little too. Um, well, thank you. Thank you again. Um, it, that's all the time we do have for, for questions today. Um, if I didn't get to your question, please feel free to send me an email to webinars at rogersbh.org. Many thanks to our presenters for taking time away from your clinical practice to share your valuable insights with us. Helping a patient on the road to recovery means collaboration among everyone involved in their treatment. With locations across the country, our treatment teams are ready to partner with you. Rogers Outreach representatives are happy to answer questions regarding our treatment services, as well as learn more about your practice. And before we conclude, I'd like to ask our presenters to share a few recommended resources on this topic with our participants. And so if you're curious about um, just the statistics and the overall picture of, of opioid use, uh, the CDC website has a lot of good stuff that I drew from heavily. And you can also make custom reports if you wanna know people in a certain state in a certain year and a certain demographic and what was their risk of overdose death or really any other kind of death or other things. They have neat little tools that you can make custom reports. Um, that can also be useful if you ever are giving a talk to like a community group or you know, something like that. Um, SAMHSA has resources, that's uh, samhsa.gov. Uh, has resources for um, 
uh, medication information that's appropriate for patients or families, uh, and as well as just general education and provider directories. Um, and as far as the kind of scientific literature, I mean, there's just, there's so much, uh, so many studies uh, uh, piling up now about effectiveness that you'll, you'll find all kinds of stuff if you use your favorite uh, search engine for that. I'd like to add to that too, the National Institute on Drug Abuse is an option as well um, for information. Some of these sites are starting to have pages on contingency management and how to um, address some of these risks that we're seeing. Um, and in addition to that, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, you also have the Recovery Research Institute. Um, so there are a lot of options out there. Um, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, I think Dr. Valentine and I both noticed in our preparation for this that the VA has been doing a lot of, um, you know, groundbreaking work with MAT and also with contingency management. So that would be um, a good place to look as well. Thank you so much. That about wraps it up, everyone. I want to remind our participants that those of you who met the required time commitment will be eligible for CE credits. About 30 minutes after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to your personal dashboard on ce-go.com, where you will be able to access PDFs of the PowerPoint presentation slides handout and a complete list of references. For those of you who met the time requirement to qualify for CE credits, we'll need to complete the evaluation to download your CE certificate for the event. If you have any questions about this follow-up email, please contact support at ce-go.com. On behalf of everyone at Rogers, we look forward to partnering with you to help you support your patients. Thank you.